In the intense confrontation between Lucas and Roman, a palpable tension hung in the air. Lucas, observing Roman, couldn't shake the feeling that he was facing a formidable adversary, a true monster. It wasn't just Roman's exceptional martial skills that gave Lucas pause. It was the subtle pressure he seemed to exert, a force that extended beyond mere physicality. As Lucas grappled with this realization, he couldn't help but reflect on how different this Roman Dimitri was from the one etched in his memory. Roman, despite his overwhelming combat abilities, had expressed his disdain for languishing in a remote region like their current surroundings. He had declared his intention to move on, to conquer the entire continent. Lucas, absorbing these words, became convinced of their validity. The prospect of eight silvers paled in comparison to the question gnawing at Lucas. Were Roman's ambitions genuine? To find out, Lucas believed he had to overcome a trial. As the one-minute timer commenced, Lucas abandoned all hesitation and charged straight at Roman. Chris, a bystander to this unfolding clash, observed with keen interest. Only Lucas, aside from the first applicant, had managed to seize the initiative against Roman. Lucas, in his assault, employed a multifaceted strategy. With a sword in hand, he aimed slashes at Roman's head, while simultaneously directing a dagger toward his heart. It was a calculated move, an attempt to exploit any vulnerability in Roman's defenses. However, Roman, a paragon of skill, effortlessly blocked Lucas's every advance. Lucas, undeterred by the initial setback, maintained his offensive. A relentless pursuit of weaknesses seemed to be his strategy. Yet Roman, like an impregnable fortress, deflected each blow with ease. Despite the frustration mounting within Lucas, he couldn't help but respect the prowess before him. An opening, Lucas thought, would inevitably present itself if he persisted. But Roman, seemingly aware of Lucas's calculations, took a step back to evade the dagger, parried the sword, and maintained his defensive stance. Undeterred, Lucas pressed on, determined to breach Roman's defenses. Time was of the essence, and any hesitation could spell his defeat. The need to endure for one minute pressed heavily on his mind. Lucas understood that maintaining the initiative was crucial, and he redoubled his efforts. Each strike became a desperate attempt to wrest control from Roman's unyielding grasp. Roman, in response, began to smirk. He recognized Lucas's tenacity and instinctive senses. In Roman's estimation, Lucas wasn't a bad opponent. The smirk hinted at a level of respect, though Roman cautioned against such decision-making on the battlefield. Roman wasn't about to let Lucas hold out for just one minute. To him, this brief time frame was more than a test. It was a symbolic wall meant to showcase the exceptional qualities of the leader the applicants would be pledging allegiance to. The purpose of the trial, according to Roman, was to impress upon the applicants the greatness of their future liege right from their initial encounter. Feeling that the duel had served its purpose, Roman decided it was time to conclude it. With a decisive strike, he sent Lucas sprawling on the floor. In that moment, Lucas contemplated the limitations of a B-rank mercenary. While an ordinary person could attain this rank through hard work and risking their life, reaching the realm of an A-rank mercenary required the ability to wield mana, a power Lucas lacked. This realization settled in, and Lucas accepted that, no matter how hard he struggled, he couldn't escape the confines of a B-rank mercenary. Despite this acknowledgement, Lucas drew strength from his experiences surviving in battlefields where countless others had perished. He grasped a fundamental truth. To survive and emerge victorious, he must employ any means necessary. This realization brought the focus back to the ongoing duel where, facing Roman, Lucas decided to throw a bag of sand into Roman's eyes. Chris, the observer, found Lucas's unexpected move valid. After all, Roman had only instructed the applicants to endure for one minute. No additional rules had been established. As the sand temporarily blinded Roman, Lucas seized the opportunity, swiftly rising from the ground and charging at him. Lucas entertained the hope that, with Roman temporarily impaired, he might gain an advantage. However, to Lucas's surprise, as he closed in on Roman, he was met with the unsettling sight of Roman's red eyes glaring directly at him through the sand. It was a testament to Roman's resilience and awareness. Lucas, acknowledging the unexpected turn of events, responded with a smile. In a spontaneous decision, he dropped his weapons and conceded, declaring his surrender. Within the confines of the heavenly demon god cult, the initiation into martial arts for the children takes an unexpected detour before the earnest teachings commence. The foundational lesson bestowed upon them is not about strikes, kicks, or stances, but rather the art of keeping one's eyes wide open. In the midst of exchanging blows, a single blink could, in the greatest sense, mean the difference between life and death. 
Much like the prescribed order for breathing to circulate internal energy, the act of blinking is elevated to a matter of serious consideration. Consequently, members of the heavenly demon cult undergo rigorous training to maintain open eyes at all times, irrespective of the situation. Returning to the duel where Lucas had chosen to surrender, a curious scene unfolds. Chris hands Roman a container of water. This simple act is the beginning of Roman's effort to rid himself of the sand that Lucas, in a moment of desperation, flung into his eyes during the duel. As Roman pours water on his face, Lucas stands behind, a mixture of embarrassment and reflection etched across his features. Lucas contemplates the unexpected turn of events. If he had known the duel would culminate in this way, he might not have resorted to using the sand. His intent was to use any means necessary to last one minute and successfully navigate the trial set before him. Yet in his eyes, the result appears nothing short of pathetic. Doubts and self-criticism surface as Lucas wonders if Roman is disappointed in him. Perhaps, Lucas ponders, Roman harbored no expectations from the outset. The looming fear of potential punishment hovers over Lucas's thoughts. Contrary to Lucas's apprehensions, Roman's response is unexpected. Rather than addressing Lucas's use of foul play, Roman calls for the next applicant with an air of nonchalance. This surprises not only Lucas, but also the other applicants who had anticipated Roman's wrath. Roman's lack of anger or inquiry leaves the onlookers in a state of bewilderment. From Roman's perspective, the sand-throwing maneuver wasn't a surprise. He had astutely observed Lucas reaching for the pouch as he gracefully evaded Roman's attack. Far from condemning Lucas, Roman intentionally allowed the unconventional tactic to play out. Roman's motivation was clear, he wanted to see Lucas at his best navigating the challenge with resourcefulness and resilience. Roman, known also as Bak Jong Hyuk, acknowledges the challenges and hardships Lucas has faced. Though Roman can't quantify the extent of the bloodshed Lucas has witnessed, he is confident that the experiences have been profound. In Roman's mind, the blood he has seen is enough to create an ocean. This realization underscores the birth of the heavenly demon, an entity forged in the crucible of trials and tribulations. With the duel momentarily set aside, Roman directs the other applicants to come forward, signaling the resumption of the trial. The arena transforms into a stage for a myriad of tactics as each participant endeavors to last one minute against Roman. As Chris observes the unfolding events, he can't help but notice that Lucas has set a precedent, inspiring every subsequent applicant to employ any means necessary to endure the rigorous one-minute duels. Roman engages in successive duels with various applicants and Lucas, from his vantage point, realizes that although foul play is not explicitly grounds for disqualification, Roman shows no mercy when the line is crossed. Lucas contemplates how, had he not surrendered earlier, he might have found himself resorting to unconventional tactics like those now attempting. The entire situation baffles Lucas. It's the 100th duel and a full two hours had elapsed since the trial commenced. Despite the physical toll, Roman remains seemingly unfazed. Lucas is particularly struck by Roman's stable breathing. In the cruel reality of combat, opponents seldom show mercy due to fatigue. Rather, unstable breathing leads to faltering movements and eventual demise. Lucas grasps the importance of mastering the intricacies of combat, aligning breath with action to harness the mana of nature. Roman's body, fortified by skeletal metamorphosis, maintains an optimal state, drawing from past experiences where combat endurance endured for three days and nights during the conquest of the Murim. Despite the relatively light sparring in the current duel, Roman's stamina stands resilient. Lucas marvels at this display of endurance, considering it against the harsh backdrop of battles where countless lives are lost. Later on, Chris gathers all the applicants, delivering the news that none have passed the second trial. However, he tempers the disappointment by assuring them that this doesn't necessarily mean there are no successful applicants. Out of the 120 present, 30 will be selected and informed at a later date. Chris commends the applicants for their efforts, and with that, everyone is dismissed for the day. The weight of anticipation and uncertainty lingers in the air as the aspiring members of the heavenly demon god cult disperse, each contemplating their performance in the trials. In the subsequent scene within Roman's office, a new phase unfolds. Roman hands Chris the list of successful applicants, entrusting him with the responsibility of training. Chris, displaying a deep sense of commitment, assures Roman that he will put forth his best efforts in this new role. As Chris carefully reviews the list of successful applicants, his attention is drawn to a familiar name, Vulcan, the individual who had boldly challenged the young master, Roman, in the initial stages of the trials. 
Chris can't help but wonder what qualities Vulcan possesses that garnered the approval of Roman. There's a sense that Vulcan must hold a considerable amount of courage to have earned this distinction. Another name on the list, Henderson, leaves Chris somewhat perplexed. From Chris's perspective, there doesn't appear to be anything particularly exceptional about Henderson. He contemplates whether Roman might see something in Henderson that escapes his own understanding. However, what truly catches him off guard is the realization that Roman has also passed Lucas, prompting him to seek clarification about this unexpected decision. Curiosity prompts Chris to question Roman about Lucas's inclusion. Roman, seemingly unperturbed, inquires if there's a problem. Chris, acknowledging Lucas's undeniable talent as a B-rank mercenary, raises the issue of Lucas's questionable conduct during the dueling trial and his premature surrender. In Chris's eyes, Lucas's decision to abandon the fight at the first sign of defeat, coupled with the use of dishonorable tactics, marks him as a potential liability on the battlefield. Putting honor aside, Chris perceives Lucas as a stereotypical mercenary whose priority is personal survival, even at the expense of comradeship. Roman's response, however, defies expectations. He affirms that this very reason led him to pass Lucas. Roman explains that, despite Lucas's apparent lack of traditional honor, in a situation where foul play was unprecedented, Lucas demonstrated a pragmatic and realistic approach to facing Roman. Roman sees individuals like Lucas as shining on the battlefield, adept at navigating chaos by constantly seeking ways to survive and find solutions, even if it means bending the rules. Roman challenges Chris's certainty that Lucas would betray his comrades solely based on his engagement in foul play. This revelation surprises Chris, prompting him to reflect on his training with Jonathan. Memories resurface of Jonathan emphasizing that survival on the battlefield is not the exclusive domain of knights like Chris and himself who wield aura. Instead, it belongs to those who can calmly assess each situation and adapt accordingly. Individuals capable of enduring until the very end, Jonathan urged Chris to keep this perspective in mind, emphasizing the value of adaptability and resourcefulness over strict adherence to conventional notions of honor. Despite Chris's prowess as a knight, the ever-present threat of ambush by unseen adversaries lurks in the shadows. Reflecting on Lucas's recent decision, Chris now sees the pragmatism in it and acknowledges his own short-sightedness. Seeking understanding, Chris turns to Roman and poses a question about something that might elude his comprehension. With five months until Roman's departure for the battlefield and the typical exemption of nobles from frontline duty, Chris is curious about Roman's early gathering of soldiers. Roman cryptically responds, hinting that the reason will soon be disclosed. The narrative shifts to the subsequent day when Barco issues an official statement. Barco, having patiently awaited the Lawrence's adherence to past promises, feels betrayed by their breach of noble honor. The Lawrences not only failed to settle ancestral debts, but also refused to surrender the land serving as collateral. Consequently, Barco announces their decision to take up arms against the Lawrences. In a public statement addressed to the Kingdom of Cairo, Barco declares that if the Lawrences don't settle their debts or relinquish the collateral land within a week, Barco, with the central government's approval, will declare a territorial war against the Lawrences. This revelation surprises Chris, leading him grappling with the sudden escalation of tensions. Roman then discloses to Chris that he plans to actively involve his army in the conflict between Barco and Lawrence. The narrative shifts to Lawrence's palace, honing in on Flora. She grapples with the weight of perceived responsibility for her family's potential downfall in the impending war with the Barcos. Flora's sleepless nights are haunted by the notion that her broken engagement with Roman Dimitri is the catalyst for their impending struggle. In the quiet hours of the night, a heavy sense of guilt drives her to wakefulness as she contemplates the consequences of her actions. As dawn breaks, the concern deepens among Flora's maids. She has secluded herself in her room since her return from Dimitri's, and the maids attribute this withdrawal to the speculated disengagement. Rumors circulate that Lady Flora's supposed mistake led to the termination of the engagement, a revelation that perplexes and disturbs the maids. Their disdain for Dimitri intensifies as they struggle to comprehend why Lady Flora would do something deserving of rejection by what they dismissively refer to as a moron. The maid's worries amplify with the news of Barcos declaring war on Lawrence, casting a shadow of uncertainty over the fate of the family. Within the confines of her room, Flora confronts the dissonance between her self-perception and the harsh reality. She once thought of herself as clever, having excelled in an advanced level course at the academy, and believed she was a dutiful daughter based on the approving smiles from her father. However, the current circumstances force her to acknowledge the fragility of her position. 
Stripped of her family's protective embrace, Flora sees herself as nothing more than a delicate flower in a greenhouse, vulnerable to the harsh elements of reality. A sense of irony pervades Flora's thoughts as she draws a parallel between the moronic Dimitri and herself, realizing that in the eyes of others, she may be the fool. This revelation shatters her confidence, leaving her unable to face her father with the same assurance she once had. Flora grapples with the dissonance between her perceived identity and the reality that her actions may have dire consequences for her family. Contemplating her predicament, Flora finds herself wondering how Roman Dimitri would navigate such a challenging situation. She recognizes a stark contrast between their characters. Roman, an individual who stands independent, needing nothing and desiring nothing from others. Roman's strength and resolute actions, such as subjugating Blood Fang for his family, leave Flora questioning when he became such a formidable force. She puzzles over the mystery of Roman's capability to undertake such significant actions independently, questioning her own inadequacies in comparison. Setting aside thoughts of Roman, Flora reflects on the resolve he displayed in his actions and the stark disparity with her own perceived shortcomings. In the face of Roman's unwavering determination, Flora feels diminished and inconsequential. Outside Flora's room, her servants deliver a meal, and as they knock on the door, Flora surprises them by suddenly opening the door. In a spontaneous decision, she expresses her desire to visit the library. This unanticipated move catches the servant off guard, leaving them curious about Flora's sudden change in routine. Inside the library, Flora contemplates her father's earnest attempts to garner support from other families amidst the impending conflict with the Barcos. However, a sense of skepticism lingers within her. She is doubtful that any neighboring families will extend assistance to the Lawrence clan in their dire situation. Drawing a parallel to Roman Dimitri's self-reliance in subjugating Blood Fang, Flora believes that, similarly, the Lawrences must navigate their challenges using their own strength and resourcefulness. The narrative shifts to the Lord's room at Lawrence Palace, unveiling a disheartening tableau. The collaborative efforts to secure support from other families have met staunch resistance. The Martell family was the first to reject Lawrence's proposal, followed by the Vastra family, who despite prior agreements, declined to offer their assistance. The Viscount of Lawrence, overseeing the chaos, receives distressing news. Neighboring regions are hesitant to intervene due to the oppressive shadow cast by the Barcos. Rumors swirl that Barcos may retaliate against anyone in the Northeast who dares to support Lawrence. The Lord faces a formidable challenge with alliances crumbling and potential allies turning their backs. Meanwhile, Flora, immersed in the library's confines, grapples with a growing sense of urgency. With only one week remaining until the war, she contemplates what she perceives as Lawrence's most viable course of action in this critical juncture. In the Viscount's office, a palpable air of disbelief hangs heady. The Viscount expresses incredulity that neighboring families, once thought to be allies, are now unwilling to extend a helping hand in the impending conflict. Seeking information and potential alternatives, the Viscount inquires about any communication from the Gold Bank. The response unveils a disheartening reality. The Gold Bank is indeed investigating the land collateral matter, but the time frame for resolution exceeds the immediacy of the impending conflict. The man further speculates that the Gold Bank, considering its significant investments in Barcos, may have chosen to align with Barcos for strategic reasons. This revelation deepens the Viscount's worry as the Lawrences find themselves without a concrete solution to their impending crisis. Within the Lawrence family, a disheartening suggestion surfaces as a noble recommends to render to the Viscount. The blockade of assistance from neighboring regions by Barcos, coupled with an evident discrepancy in troop strength, leads this noble to advocate for surrender. The rationale behind this proposal is to protect the innocent Lawrence soldiers and salvage as much land as possible. Even if it means conceding everything to Barcos, the Viscount contemplates this grim suggestion, weighing the potential cost of defiance against the perceived benefits of yielding. In the midst of this deliberation, the scene undergoes a sudden shift as Flora enters the conference room. Interrupting the somber discussions, she expresses a desire to convey something important to her father. This unexpected entrance injects an air of urgency and personal involvement into the room, leaving both the noble and the Viscount curious about what Flora has to say. The narrative then transitions to the Dimitri Palace, where Roman confronts his father with the decision that could alter the course of events in the brewing conflict between Barco and Lawrence. Roman reveals his intention to engage actively in the war under the banner of Roman Dimitri. His father, Viscount Dimitri, responds with a mixture of concern and caution, 
questioning whether Roman fully comprehends the repercussions of such a move. This Count Dimitri sternly reminds Roman that the war between Barco and Lawrence is officially sanctioned by the central government. Moreover, he underscores the potential consequences of meddling in a legitimate battle, especially considering Roman's recent dissolution of the marriage arrangement with Lawrence's daughter. Such interference, the Viscount warns, could sever ties with Northeast nobles and, at its worst, prompt the central government to send soldiers to quell any rebellion. In response, Rowan provides a more nuanced perspective on his decision. He unveils a recent threat from Anthony Barco, the eldest son of the Barco family. Anthony perceived Roman's marriage to the Lawrence as an obstacle to their plans and used intimidation to dissuade Roman. Despite lacking tangible evidence of the threat, Roman feels compelled to act. He candidly shares this revelation with his father, emphasizing the external pressures and threats that influence his course of action. Roman also hints at a deeper consideration, the perception of the Dimitri family as a formidable force in the Northeast. The notion that Dimitri holds a position as a true powerhouse in the region underscores the potential impact of Roman's involvement in the conflict. The Barcos already viewed the Dimitri family as beneath them, and Roman decides it's time to confront his father about the family's passive stance. Despite possessing considerable power and wealth, Roman believes his father is content with the current situation. In stark contrast, Roman Dimitri craves power and refuses to stand idly by while the Dimitri name is tarnished, whether by Barco or any other adversary. Roman points out the Barco strategy of declaring war based on a non-existent cause, a mere ploy for those in positions of power. He sees his current existence as navigating an endless ocean full of uncertainty. Amid this ambiguity, Roman is unwavering in his commitment to live a life of dominance. Turning to his father, Roman clarifies that he isn't seeking the family's strength. Instead, he intends to intervene in the war solely under the qualification of Roman Dimitri. He requests his father's observance, emphasizing that the path he is about to embark upon represents the life he intends to lead moving forward.